Good evening, everybody. We want to get started. So thank you so much for joining us to this edition of the Albers Executive Speaker Series. My name is Joe Phillips. I'm Dean of the Albers School, and it's a great pleasure to welcome every here, everybody here tonight and also welcome Sean Tresvant, the CEO of Taco Bell. So the format is Sean will speak for about 10 minutes, uh, and then we'll have some panelists come up who I will introduce to you later, uh, who will ask some questions that they've been thinking about. And then, as you know, when the registration process, we ask people to submit questions. So I have uh, some of those to mix in as well. So our speaker, uh, Sean Tresvant, started as CEO of Taco Bell January 1st. Uh, he started at Taco Bell two years ago as global chief brand officer. And prior to joining Taco Bell, he spent more than 15 years in leadership roles at Nike including Chief Marketing Officer of the Jordan brand. And before Nike, he did branding work at Pepsi and Sports Illustrated. Sean earned his undergraduate and master's degree in communications at Washington State, where he played on the men's basketball team. But more importantly to us, he got his MBA at Seattle University. Uh, yeah. Now, he's really nervous tonight because his father's in the audience, uh, so we have to cut him a little bit of slack, and so I'm going to leave it to Sean to maybe tell us about his dad and, and Ernie, too. So without further ado, let's have Sean come up. Thank you, thank you, thank you. How's everybody doing tonight? Good? I'm, uh, I'm not much of a podium guy, so I, I will probably just uh, come up front and then, I'm not sure the format, but I think there'll be uh, a lot of time for Q&A. Being here tonight with you guys is really, really special for me for many reasons, uh, and I'll get into those in a second. But I'm happy to be here. I'm excited to be here. Uh, this uh, state is home for me, so it's special, and obviously Seattle U is a very special place. It's probably most special is because my dad went to school here. And so from, I believe it was 61 to 64, they had a really good men's basketball team, John Trez, Van Ray Dunstan, and many, many others. So growing up, I would hear a lot of stories about Seattle University. I'd hear about the, you know, the stories on the basketball court. I'd hear about how great of a university it was. I'd hear about the people uh, of just Seattle and how much the state, uh, the city, and the school meant to my dad. So it is uh, full circle that 44 years later, after he played basketball here, I went to graduate school here. So it's an incredibly special moment for me to be sitting on the stage talking to you guys about my experience in the city and school when my dad went here 44 years ago. So that's why this is a big night for me. Uh, you usually don't have your dad in the crowd when you're talking about uh, uh, your journey, but, but it's special. So I thought I would just take 10 minutes or show to tell you about my journey, uh, and then we can get into the Q&A. Let's start kind of from the beginning. Born and raised at Seattle University, and I never had any idea that I would become a CEO of Taco Bell. I was telling the class before this is that my philosophy in life is always be where your feet are. So I grew up in Seattle. I had the chance to play basketball at uh, Washington State University. After playing basketball, I'm not 6'7 like my dad. I wish I had a few more inches, but I realized pretty quick that um, I probably wasn't going to play professional basketball. It was always a dream of me, but I probably wasn't going to do that given size and skill. So if I'm not going to be a professional basketball player, I still wanted to be the best at whatever I decided to do. Washington State was really good in communications. Uh, it was a top communication school, so I wanted to be a sportscaster. ESPN was just taking off at that time. And I thought I would be the next Stuart Scott. I thought I'd be the next great ESPN sportscaster. So I decided to go back and get my master's communications at Washington State. And a funny thing happened. Uh, I got humbled really quick when I got back to Seattle after my undergrad degree, my master's degree, and I couldn't get a job. I thought jobs would just be knocking on the door, and I came back, and I couldn't get a job. And so my parents said, hey, you can't pout. You got to get out there, and you got to figure it out. So I started working at Gala Wines. I merchandised wines. I was in the back room, you know, dragging bo bottles of wine out, dusting them off, putting them on the shelf. And one day, uh, a person saw me, and they liked my work ethic, had nothing to do with my education, had nothing to do with where I went to school. He said, you have great wor work ethic, and I'd like you to come work for Campbell Soup, which was another great brand. Needless to say, uh, after the holidays, I called 
Campbell Soup. I worked for a salesperson at Campbell Soup. We'd go back to Camden, New Jersey, where uh, Campbell Soup was located. And I loved the marketing presentations, whether it was the Chunky Soup or the V8 or the Condensed Soup. Brand management was like something that touched me at that time. So I asked my boss, well, how do you become a brand manager? And he said, you got to go back and get your MBA. And I said, well, I got a master's in communications. And he said, no, you got to go back and get your MBA. So that time, I was like, where do I go back and get my MBA? And I would tell you, um, without a doubt, the reputation of this school, the reputation of the business school, the reputation of the people, the staff, the faculty, everything in between. It was a pretty quick decision that I decided to come back at Seattle University and get my MBA. It was a great two years. It was fast and furious. I made some, met some great professors, learned a lot. But after I got my MBA, I had to make a decision to stay with Campbell Soup or do something else. Me and my sister are really close. She moved to New York, so I moved to New York with her. In New York, I worked for a company called Reckon and Ben Keyser. I worked for Pepsi. I worked for Sports Illustrated. Uh, and then I had the chance to move back west and work for Nike. And for me, Nike was like the holy grail. It was the place that uh, I always thought I would work, always wanted to work. And to get the opportunity to work at Nike was like the top of the top. Uh, and it was great. It was a great 15 years there. I learned a lot. I always tell people I got my MBA from Seattle University, but I got my PhD in marketing from Nike. I, I really did. Uh, 16 years, great company, great people. I brought my full self to work, which I'm sure we'll talk about a little bit. But after 15 years, uh, the trajectory started to slow. The fire burning in my belly started to slow. The learning started to slow. So I had to make a, a really tough decision. Do I leave the company uh, that I worked for 15 years and continue to jog? Or do I go to a place that's a little uncomfortable, a um, little scary, but it will give me a chance to learn more, run around the bases, get up and have the fire back in my belly? And I chose to leave Nike. And I would tell people I haven't looked back one day. Taco Bell is an amazing brand. Um, I love all my experiences throughout my career, but I feel like now, at this time, with the job I have, I'm truly bringing my whole self to work. Taco Bell is a big brand, about 15, 16 billion dollars, about 8,500 restaurants, both uh, 7,500 in the US, 1,000 internationally. A brand is pushing the envelope forward on digital with the consumer. And I'm really, really happy that all my experiences, including my experience here at uh, Seattle U, gave me the opportunity uh, to be doing what I'm doing. So that's me in a nutshell. It's been a, a crazy journey, like I said. I never thought being from Kirkland, Washington or going to the school that my career would take the, the path it has. But if I could give, I told this class, if I could give you guys any advice, enjoy the journey. Uh, be where your feet are planted. I think if I, if I was always looking at that next job, I wouldn't have enjoyed all the experience I've, I've had professionally that I got the chance to be with other people who taught me a lot or I learned from. And I think that's important as you guys go through life is just make sure that you uh, don't only live the length of life, make sure you're living the width of life as well. So that's me. Uh, I am open to some q and I think we're going to have some panelists come up, and then we can kind of get after it. All right, this is the hot seat. Okay, it's hot seat. Okay, I'll take it. All right, thanks, Sean. That was a great opening for us. Um, let me introduce the panelists, and then we'll get to the questions. All right, so first there's Chance Ringer. He's a senior from Oahu, Hawaii, and a double major in marketing and business analytics and minor in economics. He uh, has served as an Albers New Student Mentor and been involved in various student organizations such as Alpha Kappa Psi and the Hawaii Club. And after graduation, Chance wants to work with customer data to identify strategies that will benefit and empower consumers. All right, then next to Chance is Annie Katrina Lee. Annie is a seasoned marketing executive with nearly two decades of experience in consumer tech, working at companies like Twitch, Pinterest, Amazon, and Microsoft. She now serves as an advisor and fractional CMO for startups and organizations. She earned her Master's of Communication with UW and her undergraduate degree in marketing here at Seattle University. She's an engaged alumna, having served on the alumni board and as an adjunct faculty for the Albers School. And currently, uh, she volunteers on the Albers Marketing Advisory Board. And then furthest from me is Anna Cornell. Anna is a student 
in our MBA in Sport and Entertainment Management program. She grew up in Yakima, Washington, graduated from Carroll College in Helena, Montana. After graduation, she joined the Navy and served for 12 years as a surface warfare officer on cruisers and destroyers across the US and abroad. She currently works at Boeing in product support for the KC-46 tanker team. So, Anna, why don't you switch over to the seat next to Chance? Yeah. I don't want to be in the middle of things. Uh, yeah. Uh, but anyway, Chance, why don't you take the first question? Sure. Hello. Thank you so much for being here today. Of course, of course. Um, I think I'm going to start off with a question regarding a very popular food item. Um, so as chief brand officer, um, you and your team are responsible for bringing back the Mexican pizza. Yeah. And so that was a very successful yeah. release, relaunch. And so my question is kind of looking back, what do you think led to the big success of bringing back that food item? Yeah, the, the Mexican pizza was a, it was a great story in marketing and a great story uh, and how a consumer responds to your product. So the story of Mexican pizza is during COVID, uh, Taco Bell had to make some tough calls. Uh, as you can imagine, uh, it's all about making sure during tough times like COVID, you're driving profit. At the time, Mexican pizza was selling seven a day. Seven, when I say seven a day, the average uh, Mexican pizza sales per store was about seven. And so it was an item that, while we thought it was a little bit of a, icon within the menu, uh, we had to make some tough decisions, so we had to take it off the menu. Now, fast forward post-COVID, there was a very popular pop singer named Doja Cat, who- uh, Love her, love her. Who, who tweeted uh, at Taco Bell, and, and very unapologetically said, bring the Mexican pizza back. <laughs> and so, uh, at that moment, uh, we're reading the tweets live, uh, and we decided to have some fun. And I think one of the best things about Taco Bell is like we, we like to have fun and we like to be a little bit zig when other people are zagging. So we reached out to Doja Cat and said, let's have some fun with this. If you're willing to kind of play along with us uh, and have some fun, we'll bring the Mexican pizza back. So the highlights were she was all in. And we let Doja be Doja, which is a little scary. <laughs> So yeah, That's which, for is, sure. which is a little scary. Very so much. we weren't we weren't writing her tweets, we weren't writing her content. We let her be her. Uh, Ninety percent of it worked out okay. Uh, she announced at Coachella that the Mexican pizza was coming back. Now, come the day it's going to come back. Can't remember the exact day it's going to come back, but it was in the spring. So now remember, before COVID, we're selling seven a day. And for for those who work in the restaurant business. Uh, working in a restaurant is very, very hard. You have to prepare meals. You got crazy customers. There's a lot of things going on in a restaurant. So when we came back, our best estimate is that we were going to sell about 200 a day. And so we had ingredients for 200 a day. We trained team members on how to make, you know, be quick on the line with making 200 Mexican pizzas a day. It launched, and we were selling 500 a day. And so you can imagine, you know, team members in the restaurant making 500 pizza, Mexican pizzas per day. And we sold out. So it's like the sneaker business. It was like, it was, it was very bad, but it was good at the same time. So we had to come apologize uh, to our fans that we sold out. So we only, didn't only bring it back once, we brought it back twice. Uh, and it was a really successful brand. But it was, a, it was a, uh, a master class in how to market a product using a celebrity like Doja Cat and let them do them and not try to script them too much. Awesome, very brilliant, thank you. Yeah. Great Good shoes, evening, by sir. the way. Oh, thank you, Doc Martens. <laughs> <laughs> Both of you guys, great shoes. Speaking of your marketing background, how did your marketing background prepare you for the, your CEO role? Yeah, it's it's a it's a untraditional path to the CEO seat for sure. Uh, but I've always been curious, and so while I was in the function of marketing, I was always curious about P and Ls. While I was in the function of marketing, I was always curious about, uh, we'll call it digital, and, and digital connectivity with consumers. And while I was a CEO, there was nothing like I would read a lot. I'd understand different parts of the business. I just think if you're in business, um, you can't be siloed to your function. You should be curious about other parts of the business you're in, whatever it is. You know, I've always been one that's curious. So while I was a marketeer, 
I had a little bit of a long stretch on what other things and how other parts of the business worked at Nike or Taco Bell. I think that's the thing that helped me the most is that I was seen as a little bit somebody more of a generalist that had a marketing expertise versus somebody that could only do marketing. Thank you. Um, I have a non-marketing question from the marketer in the room. Um, So I've worked at a lot of companies to know that internal brand and internal culture can greatly impact the success of a company. And now that you're CEO of Taco Bell, I'm just curious, how are you taking your past experiences and incorporating that into the culture? What will remain the same? And what will be more of your vibe as the company goes forward? So let's talk about the latter first. Uh, What's important to me is that uh, I'm always going to be authentic, Sean. When I first started at Taco Bell, my former boss who was, who was a dear friend of mine and a mentor of mine, talked about me coming over to Taco Bell. And I said, Mark, I will take this job if I can be Sean. And what that means is I'm going to wear sneakers. I'm probably not going to wear a blue blazer. I'm probably not going to talk in the King's English. But if you can take all of Sean, you're going to get all of Sean. And I think it's really important, at least for me and then people who work at jobs, is that you are yourself. I didn't want to be somebody at home and then have to put on a face or somebody different at work. So my personal brand was always authentic me and don't change for anybody, which is really important to me because I think when you start changing for a job or for a position or for a team, things go wrong pretty quick. So for me personally, I was just, I'm just going to do me and I've always kind of been the same way. And then I think the higher you go up, um, my job is not to run finance. My job is not to even run marketing anymore. My job is not to run real estate. My job is to create the conditions so people can thrive. My job is to make sure the culture's right. That, my job is to make sure the team is working together. And it's a little bit of a mindset shift because sometimes I want to roll up the sleeves and jump in and do it, but, but that's not my job anymore. My job is truly to create the culture, the atmosphere, the environment so the team can thrive uh, is what's most important in my job now. Thank you. All right, so next question I have. Um, One interesting thing that I found out about one of your marketing approaches is that you didn't focus on a demographic, but a psychographic, which is a group of people that share common values. And I believe in the interview, you identified this as the cultural rebel. Well, how you guys did your Um, research. (laughs) And so I was just curious, how do you identify the cultural rebel? And what was kind of the process of coming up with that marketing segment? Yeah, I... uh, Taco Bell always wants to be a brand within culture. We we think it's our secret sauce. We think it it differentiates us from other brands out there, whether you're in the QSR industry or not. We want a brand that that has an epicenter that it really understands culture. And so youth or Gen Z is is the target we're going after. Now, we're going to sell to everybody, you know, 5 to 55 and beyond, but who we're going to speak to will be this, this consumer we call the cultural rebel. Think of the cultural rebel as a subset of Gen Z who are curious, they're unconventional, they're making change, they're driving things forward, they're the ones TikToking, they're the ones going to your restaurant and and posting on Instagram. That's who um, we're speaking to. And it's a a little bit of mind shift. We're going to sell to everybody. But the the example I give you, if you're at a party just shouting to everybody, nobody's going to hear you. But when you go up to a person or an individual or group and you talk to them directly, they're going to hear you. And so who we're trying to talk to is a Gen Z group called the Cultural Rebel, while not alienating anybody on the, on the edges. Got it. And I guess so far in your new position, um, are you continuing to use that marketing segment? And have you seen continued success? Yeah, they're trying to keep me out of marketing, but, uh, <laughs> but I... Uh, I'm trying to, I know, I know a backdoor in. But yeah, what I say uh, makes companies successful, no matter company, three things. Strategy, does the company have the right strategy to win? Uh, and I think we have the right strategy, and that includes the cultural rebel. The second, you have the right team. Uh, is your team uh, a bunch of uh, A-list or all-stars who can drive the business forward? And the third thing is culture. And, and right now, with the Culture Rebel and the brand and, 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 and future-proofing the brand, I think we have the right strategy. I think we have a, a, a championship team. And I think uh, we are working, it's probably on me more than anybody, on the culture. Cool. Thank you. 
Sure, that's a great segue. It's okay. as if you knew my question. Okay. okay. Uh, which was on culture. As a CEO, I imagine that you have a large hand in shaping culture, yeah. organizational culture. How do you go about shaping that culture? Do you create a vision? Do you have a vision for that? Yeah. I'll stop talking and let you No, it's great. I'm thinking these are all great questions. Where I come from, um, leadership is most important. I think leadership drives culture. There's a saying that uh, culture eats strategy for breakfast, but I think within that, culture is driven by great leaders. And so when I started uh, CEO, but I, I kind of did it before the official date, I have three leadership philosophies that I wanted the brand to believe in. The first was this idea of it's about the we versus me, and not me, Sean, but it's about the team, it's about the brand before the individual. I think great teams, whether you're on a sports team or an intramural team or just a work team, uh, the teams that win are the teams that make it about the collective versus the individual. That was my first leadership philosophy. My second one is be the change. Obviously it comes from, from Gandhi in that leadership is not a title, a level, uh, a pay scale. Leadership is individual. Leaders, there's leaders in this room and within Taco Bell, there's leaders who are senior execs and there's leaders who are uh, assistants. And it doesn't matter your position. Don't be afraid to be the change to make the brand better. 100% anybody can lead and everybody should be able to make change to make the brand better. And the third is this idea of empowerment. Uh, and big, Taco Bell's a $16 billion, brand, $16 billion brand, global brand, with about 1,000 people who work there. We have to be able to empower the next generation coach, mentor, develop the next generation to some, some one day take our seats. So if you have great leaders, great leaders will create a great culture and it will be the separator from, from brands. Thank you. Yeah. Um, as you mentioned, there's a lot of leaders and to be leaders in this room. And uh, for someone who is very experienced, what are some of the hardest lessons that you've learned in your career that you wish you knew uh, when you're finishing college? Hmm. It's a long time ago. <laughs> uh, I think um, there's probably three or four that I, I would say are along my journey that um, if I had to do it all over again, I would. if I had something to tell my younger self, I would, I would tell, don't be in a hurry. Enjoy every experience along the way. And sometimes they don't make sense. And I've worked at companies, I was telling the class before, that when, you, when you read the bio, um, the journey seems very linear. It seems like per like nothing happened. This this guy had the must have hit the lottery. There was a lot of pitfalls. There was a lot of left turns. There were a lot of trap doors. Um, but I feel I learned as much from the trap doors, the pitfalls, the left turns, the bad experiences as I did the good. And so when I say don't be in a hurry, even though I worked at Sports Illustrated for two years, it was a left turn. It wasn't my favorite. But I learned a lot about who I want to be as a leader. I learned a lot about what kind of company I want to work at. So I try to take something from the good and the bad experiences. And sometimes when we're in a hurry, we miss things. So I'd say um, don't be in a hurry. The second one is um, have a North Star. A lot, of people, a lot of people would say, hey, how do I work at Nike? And I think that's a, an incredible North Star. I think Taco Bell is a North Star. Or being from Seattle, you want to, want to work at Microsoft. But I also think we're a um, we're holistic and we're a collective of our experiences. So while you might want to work uh, at the Seattle Mariners one day, get the experiences that will help you get there. And along my way, I feel like uh, I wasn't in a hurry, and that the experiences I've had all added up to something that um, Taco Bell thought was interesting versus a very linear experience. Thank you. I can relate. <laughs> exactly. All right, so this is my last question, I believe. Yeah. So as an undergrad, I'm currently focused in marketing and business analytics, and I think that's perfect because at one of the conferences you were at, I believe it was called Create, wow. um, you had four wonderful marketing strategies, Yeah. and one yeah. of them was math and magic, yeah. which basically implies that for a good marketing strategy, you need to be able to utilize magic as well as math or data. And so my question is, do you see the future of Taco Bell utilizing more data? And then another question, follow-up question, 
would be, are there any times where you needed to use data to make an impactful analysis that you couldn't have made without data? Yeah. That's a great question. Uh, I think today, marketeers uh, or business people have to balance the scale. I don't think you can be all math, and I don't think you can be all magic. And I think it's tricky. There, there is more um, data than ever today. And, Definitely. and I think a lot of brands can, can paralyze themselves in decision making through data. Right. Data is really, really important, and it should inform how you get somewhere. But I've seen companies that overanalyze, over correct, over uh, rely on an insight or a piece of data, and they wait too long and they miss the moment. Mm -hmm. uh, on the other side, uh, if it's all gut, if it's all heart, if it's all here's what I think we should do, that's probably not the best way ever. So a little bit of a cheated answer. I think best companies today balance both. I don't think you can be all math, and I think it's dangerous these days to be all magic. And I think if you balance the, the scale of the pendulum somewhere in between where you can still, man, that's a great idea, and I think we just should just do it, with the, and here's what the consumer or the insight or the data is telling us, those are, that's probably the, the, uh, the magic kind of unlock when it's kind of balanced on both versus the scales are, are tipped one way or another. Definitely. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Sir, you talked about uh, or touched on mentors. Yeah. And I was just curious if you could tell us about a mentor in your career that's meant a lot to you um, and the things, types of things you talked about, the types of things that they gave you advice. Yeah. Well, besides, besides the gentleman over there, the handsome gentleman over there, uh, besides kind of family mentors, um, there was this mentor uh, of mine named Gino Fizzanati. He, he was my boss at Nike, and by far, he was the best marketeer I ever worked with. And, and while, it, while it was interesting, he was not easy on me. I mean, he was not, I, I mean, Nike is a, is a place where um, it's not for the faint of heart, and he gave me tough feedback, uh, and he let me know it. And at the time, I don't know how I took it, I don't know, I didn't see it, um, but I didn't realize he was making me a lot better as a marketeer. And uh, there's many times where we used to get into it, there's many times that I thought it was perfect, and he said, it's not perfect, you had to go back and do it. But bearing through it with Gino and understanding how he thought and how it's almost like the Karate Kid. I didn't even know the skills I was, I didn't even know, right? Until something came up and I painted the fence and I waxed the car. And I think mentorship is really, really important. Uh, we're all sitting here because somebody took a chance on us or we had somebody to talk to or learn from. But it's not always easy. It's not always rainbows. And, and Gino was a great mentor, but I didn't realize um, what he was trying to do because he was so tough on me. But at the end of the day, he was just trying to make me better. And sometimes you got to accept that you're, you're not great or you need to learn. Or and everybody has a different style of learning and teaching. And he was a great mentor, but it wasn't one of those, let's go have a cup of coffee and a croissant and talk about how good you are. <laughs> it, was, it was not that type of mentorship. Fair enough, thanks. <laughs> yeah. So speaking of mentors, yeah. I'm curious about young mentors. I have a five-year-old who humbles me every day. Yeah, yeah. And I have been learning a lot from Gen Z. And I think Gen Z has been teaching us a lot about just values and even marketing best practices. And so what's a pleasant surprise that you've learned from someone who reported to you or maybe was on your team any time in your career? Um, so it reversed learning, I suppose. Yeah, I have a, a, a teenager and a 22-year-old. So right in the epicenter of, we'll call it a cultural rebel, a Gen Zer and somebody who who just knows pop culture, so I get humbled uh, <laughs> every day if I don't know the latest thing on TikTok, if I haven't seen um, a piece of content that's trending. Uh, I get humbled every day, and it, the the funny thing is, is as a CEO, they they expect I know everything, so they might be talking, or she's like, Dad, did you see this thing on TikTok by so and so and so and so? It's got like a million views, and I'll say no, and they're like. <gasps> You haven't seen, like, I'm supposed to know everything that's ever happened uh, in the world. And uh, when I don't know an acronym or I don't know a creator or I don't know the newest style, it's very humbling to ask them. But the best thing about that, when I work in, I say, hey, did you guys see that piece of content? They're like, how did he know? 
How did he know that just dropped last night? How did he know about that? So I use them as, as leverage. <laughs> okay, so I have some questions that the audience gave in advance. The first one I'm going to ask is this, Sean. What was your biggest lesson from working on the Jordan brand that you could bring to the Taco Bell brand? That's a good one. Uh, Jordan is um, an incredible brand. I don't know. There was a trivia question about this. How many brands in the world logo is themselves and still living? Ralph Lauren is not it because he's not the polo guy. Uh, it's a trivia question. I forgot the answer. When I worked an answer, I know, but it's like, it's a, it's a handful. And, and Jordan is one of those people who is still alive, and it's actually him who's the logo. And so working for that brand, um, I came up at a time when I told you I loved ESPN. Every highlight ESPN when I watched it at 8 o'clock at night was Michael Jordan, dunking, scoring 52. So when you're able to work for that brand who you idolized and grew up with, it's pretty special. Now imagine that, and then he walks into the room. And you're like, jaw drops, you gotta smack yourself, <laughs> tell yourself to be cool, be cool. But it was, a, it was like a um, dream come true to be able to work for that brand and that man and understand kind of what motivated him. I'm sure you guys all saw The Last Dance. What motivated him to be so great? And I was just a sponge uh, learning from him, listening to him, because how he was on the basketball court is the same way he is in business. He doesn't want to lose. He wants to win. He wants to be the best. He, he, he is the same. There's no talk about authentic self. He is no different than he was, you know, winning six championships with the Bull that he is in, in the boardroom. And so it was an incredible experience. And, and what I think that I learned at Jordan that I brought to Taco Bell is that the consumer decides. A lot of times companies get a little full on themselves and they think they know what's best for the consumer. They think because they're big, or because they're successful, they now will tell how consumers should think, act, or feel. Nike and Jordan was about the consumer. It was about making sure they understood what makes consumers tick. And if I brought anything to um, Taco Bell, it was like, let's make sure we're, we're delivering, we're serving delicious, craveable, innovative food that the consumer wants, not what we think they want. Speaking of Jordan. Yeah. Do you have a favorite Jordan or Nike sneaker? Yeah, they asked me, they asked me in the class before, how many sneakers do I have? <laughs> and uh, I'm probably embarrassed to say this now. I don't think my dad knows this. So I just moved from, from Portland to, um, to California, to Los Angeles. And in, my, in the move, I had to count my sneakers. Uh, I clocked in at 502. Um, Solid. I clocked in at 502. And uh, it's a habit. It's a habit. Uh, <laughs> And it's hard, it's hard, it's like picking kids. It's like hard. You got five minutes. Yeah, that's fair. It's fair. It's hard, it's hard, it's hard, it's, it's hard to I pick. I would never ask you to do that. Yeah, 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 yeah. But it's, also. It's hard. But, but there's, some, there's some that are very special to me. There's some that are like my first pair that I uh, like got at Nike. And I, and I, I got a habit. I, coll I, I stopped collecting because there's no more room in my house. Uh, <laughs> but I'm a collector, so it's, it's, um, it's something that someday, like, I will pass down to my kids. They probably won't get it. But I just, I, I just love sneakers, and I got a little bit of a habit. I can understand that. So what was your first pair that you got? My first pair was an Air Jordan 2 uh, for you sneakerheads in there. If you think about the Air Jordan 2 now, uh, Air Jordan 2, Air Jordan 1 was a red and black one that he wore in his first game, and he got fine. So it was, it, was a, it was a different take on the basketball shoe because it had a different silhouette, and it was red and black, and at the time, there was only white basketball sneakers. So that was pretty special. But when I walked into the Foot Locker at Bellevue Square and saw the AJ2, which was made in Italy, had a, had a reptile print, didn't have the swoosh on it, was just crafted and, 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 and the materials were nothing like I ever saw before. And so when I saw that, that's what I think my first love with sneakers was. Because it was the craft, it was the make, it was the way it made you feel. I put it on, I thought I could go from the free throw line. It was just, it was just different. I thought it was different. Thanks. But what was the, fav the favorite of you said that in the class? My favorite, which one? Your favorite of all the sneakers you have. My favorite is the 2 or the 11. Uh, the 11 is um, 
I, I, I look at them at works of art. They're not even sneakers. The 11 is just a, an incredible work of art. If you just look at that shoe and the patent leather and the silhouette, and it's just it's a work of art. So if we had to take the same favorite theme to Taco Bell, yeah. what, what is your favorite yeah. item on the Taco Bell menu? The, the, one thing, <laughs> the one thing at Taco Bell sneakers is an easy habit. Uh, when I went at Taco Bell the first day, <laughs> The first day is, uh, there's a test kitchen in Taco Bell, and when you work at Taco Bell, or when you're new at Taco Bell, you gotta try the menu. And I don't say one or two, you gotta try the menu. So, uh, and then when, every time we come out with a new item, you gotta try every variation of it. So, um, it's like, I can't pick a favorite Taco Bell, but my go-to order is uh, two crunchy tacos, bean burrito, and a Baja Blast. Uh, and I would tell you, I grew up eating Taco Bell. A lot of people say, did you grow up eating Taco Bell? I grew up eating Taco Bell. Uh, I love the brand. I love the food. Uh, and I, it never gets old. Like, we have a Taco Bell in our cafeteria. We have a test kitchen. There's one by my house in L.A. Um, but, but crunchy tacos are just, just the thing. Um, yeah, this is a little more of a silly question. But when I told a lot of my friends that I had this opportunity to be a panelist, yeah. um, they asked me to ask this one question. And the question is, what are the chances of bringing back the quesarito? And if not, what is the reasoning? We would like to know. It just got real. It just got real. Uh, there's a strategy on... Uh, it, it, it's funny. Uh, I, I, tell, I told the story when I started Taco Bell. When I, when I worked at Nike, I would go to parties, I'd go to restaurants, and I'd be the most popular person because they'd say, hey, what's it like working with Michael Jordan? Or what's about the sneaker? Or what, you know, how, how is Kobe? They, they'd ask a lot of questions. I think I'm more popular now because now when I go to places and I say, we're at Taco Bell, they're like, hey, when is, when is the quesarito? When's the double-decker taco? When's the carbonara banana coming back? And chorito. I, and, and chorito is coming, coming back. Uh, I mean, there's things on the menu that I, that I don't even remember when they're coming back. And... Uh, we have a plan. It's all going to come back. It's got to come back in, in, in phases. But, but uh, we didn't. We last year for the first time we pitted two items and the fans voted on it. Mm -hmm. uh, and the response to have the fans vote on which item you want to come back. We thought we had something, but um, people are passionate about their Taco Bell. People are passionate about things back. So, throughout the next, we'll call it two years, we're going to put two things against each other, and the fans will decide what comes back. So get out there and vote. So it's in your hands. Yes, get out there and vote. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. The fans will decide. The fans will decide. Um, sir, you talked about leadership. Yeah. Uh, and I am, I'm curious about a moment in your career where you realized that you were a leader based on the situation, and what did that moment teach you about leadership? I told, I told a story to the, to the other class is that um, I'll do the brief version of the story. When COVID happened and everybody was on Teams or Zoom, uh, you're laughing because you know the story. Uh, I wasn't really good with the mute button. <laughs> Sometimes you forget that the mute button is not on. And uh, I had an unfortunate incident with the mute button not being on. And uh, two things happened. One, um, I realized that what I said while the mute button wasn't on um, didn't make somebody feel so good. The second thing, which I think all leaders do, is I admitted I made a mistake. And I publicly apologized to that person for making that mistake. And believe me, it took a while for me to get there. Uh, I'm a very prideful person. I didn't think I was in the wrong. There's many reasons, but um, Looking myself in the mirror is like, what do great leaders do? They made, when they made a mistake. And it took me a while to get there, but I, I admitted I made a mistake, and, and quite honestly, it made me a better leader. It made me understand that um, it's okay to make a mistake. You're human if you make mistakes, and it's okay to apologize for making that mistake. And that's what leadership is about. And it probably took me you know, 20 years of my career to really realize that at that time. Thanks. Yeah. Um, earlier, you talked about the balance of art and science, not leaning on data too much, but also not leaning on gut too much. Yeah. You also talked about listening to your customers and really letting that um, drive your strategy. 
how do you balance or strike that balance when it's a difference between the vocal minority versus a true representation of your customers? How do you, how do you decipher the difference? I don't know if this will answer your question. The way I think about it is great brands hit people in the head and they hit them in the heart. And you can be efficient and have great operations and have great pricing uh, and do all the things, at least in our business, that are, are really functional and really smart from an operational standpoint. And that is good. But that's only half the qu equation. Great brands make people fall in love with them. Great brands have this unbelievable connection and, and almost a, a, a cult-like following because they're in love with you. And most of the people in this room has been in love in one way or another. When you're in love, it's irrational. When you're in love, you got to have that brand. And so what I found in my, my career is hit people in the head, right pricing, clean operations, the right things, but also hit people in the heart because the heart is what keeps people coming back. Okay, another audience question. Um, so what do you think are some of the key skills that one needs to be a successful marketer? How do you, how, what do you really need if you're gonna be a CMO someday? What are the keys there, do you think? There's a, there's a lot. There's, um, you gotta be curious. I talked about being curious. So just make sure as, as you guys, there's a lot going on in the world today and technology, people, consumer insights move faster than ever. Stay curious uh, about the world, about economics. I'm not an economic major, but in my job today and in CMO's job, you gotta understand what's happening in the financial markets, what's happening uh, as far as pricing and interest rates and inflation. So I'd say, one, stay curious. Two, make sure you understand where the consumer's going. There's a famous quote by Wayne Gretzky, skate to the where the puck is gonna be, not where it is. So just as consumers change fast, digital change fast, who knew? You know, but four years ago, Taco Bell had zero digital business. Four years ago, zero. Now it's up, it's up where around 30, 35%. But you have to make sure you know where consumers are going and understand like, hey, most people are not coming into restaurants anymore. They're gonna order on their phone, they're gonna collect, click and collect, they're gonna go through the drive through So just make sure you are truly tuned in to consumer behavior. Three, uh, be a great leader. Again, I think all marketers, because they're a lot of companies, they are the, we'll call it the engine of, of the brand. Make sure you, you are a great leader. And, and probably the most important thing for, for the people who are in uh, business school or undergrad is have intangibles. It's, it's really important. I was telling the other people, like I, I interview a lot of people, and not many times do I just look at their resume. Not many times do I just look at the grand port average. Not many times do I just look at what classes they took. It's really important that you roll up your sleeves. It's really important that you come to work on time. It's really important that no job is too big, too small to do something. And I think more and more uh, today, people look at the technical skills, but they also look at the intangibles. They also look about, do people like to actually work with you? Are you a good person? The intangibles matter more than ever today for big companies. Uh, there's, there's, Seattle U is an incredible uh, institution, incredible place to get your degree from. But that can't only be it. You've got to have the intangibles as well to be successful these days. Yeah, so I know you shared a lot of the strategies you shared at that conference, and there was one more that I wanted to point out. And it's along the lines of really prioritizing certain goals and sticking with them rather than just doing everything. And I feel like as an undergrad student and as many people here are, we're all very ambitious and we want to be able to do as many things as possible. And so my question for you is, how do you prioritize the goals you want to achieve, not only at Taco Bell, but also in your personal life? Mm, mm, that's a good one. Uh, I, I'm one who, uh, I think you got to take time uh, to reflect. And we're all busy. Uh, this, this little device called the cell phone has taken all of our time. Definitely. And, and what I try to do is every morning when I get up, the alarm goes off, and I take five minutes to reflect, think about my day, have some gratitude uh, for my family and, and, 
you know, uh, some of my success. And it's five minutes, and that five minutes seems like an hour, and it's only five minutes. But I think um, for you to reach your goals, you got to take time to pursue your goals. And between class and work and your parents and this and that, a lot of people don't take the time to sit, write down your goals, think about the path to your goals. And so I've always, lately, I didn't do it forever, but I just try to take five minutes of my day, give some gratitude, think about my day, think about what can I do different today, what are some challenges for today, and then I get up and go about my day. And I think that can be true in your personal life, and I think that could be true in business. One, you know, one personal goal to share is I used to run a lot when I was at Nike, and I got busy, and I, work is always crazy, so I set a goal for myself to run, be able to run five miles. At my height, I ran a half marathon, and now I'm struggling around two miles. So I set a personal goal, I'm gonna run five miles, uh, but I can't achieve that personal goal without every Saturday getting up and going to run. I can't achieve that personal goal if I can have to put the work aside for, for an hour or two and go work on my endurance. And so as you guys chase your goals, you gotta make time for your goals. You can't say one day I'm gonna be you know, a CMO or a marketing director, a VP of marketing, or even a CEO, and not put the time in to achieve your goal. Very well said, thank you. Thank you. Sir, was that five miles in a row? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. At one time. Hopefully, hopefully. We're not going to talk about the pace. It's just... Nah, don't worry about it. We're not going to talk worry about, about it. We're just finish five miles. It doesn't matter. <laughs> um, sir, I'm curious about giving back and the role that... Please don't call me, sir. Oh. Sean. Ah. The Navy sometimes <laughs> comes out. Uh, just feel like I'm my dad over there. So. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, curious about giving back, the role yeah. that that has played in your life of people giving back to you uh, and of you giving back to others. Yeah, I'll, I like to tell stories. So I'll tell you a story which, which will hit two different, two different things. When I became the uh, CMO of Jordan, it was like a town hall. And uh, it was like get to know Sean, I think was the name of the town hall. So it was a town hall and it was a lot of softball questions and it was, it was great. And then it was like, okay, one last question. And the guy in the back of the room, uh, a black guy um, named Chris Beard, uh, raised his hand. And he said, hey, Sean, you've been very successful as a black man. How are you giving back to black people? And it literally, you could hear a pin drop. Uh, and I was on my back feet. I was on my back feet, and I didn't have a great answer to the question. I didn't have a great answer to the question. You know, and obviously it still haunts me today. Uh, that didn't have a great answer to that question. So coming out of that meeting, um, I said, if anybody ever asks me that again, uh, I'm going to have the right question. So if you ask me like how I'm giving back, I think it's two-pronged. One, um, much to my admin's dismay, it's really important that I come do things like this. Uh, yes, the schedule's crazy. Yes, I'm flying to Vegas in two hours. But to be able to come and talk to the Seattle U faculty, students, and people is really important to me because I wish I had somebody do that when I was younger. And so I always want to make sure that no matter what level I achieve, that I'm giving back to people who, if you find just one inspirational message from today, it was, it was, worth, it was worth the trip. Uh, and I do a lot of it. I do it uh, uh, within California. I did it when I was at Nike, and I'm going to continue to do it more and more. And then, and then on the other hand, it's like, you know, as a black man uh, who's, who's had some, some moderate success, are you making sure that you're paving, paving the way for other, uh, we'll call it diverse individuals or black people? And uh, I joined this group called Becca, which is, uh, which is basically a CMO think tank uh, with some of the best CMOs in the world. And the whole charter of Becca is to make sure we pave the way for diverse, unprivileged individuals. And so that's just two things I'm doing now. And I wanna do more and more and make sure that I'm truly giving back because it's important. I think the people who uh, never forget, like they were all sitting in this seat once and it's important that people look up to you and get inspired for you and can just pull things from you, that, that means a lot to me. Uh, and I said in the other class, someday people in this audience are gonna be very, very uh, famous, aware, you're gonna do great things. Make sure you guys come back. Make sure you give back. Thanks. Um, you talked about being curious, mm -hmm. and I'm, 
I'm curious mm-hmm. what you're looking forward to learning this year. Maybe something that you're looking to learn more about, um, getting more context, um, something, you know, maybe it's something to help you with your job or it could be just to further your personal endeavors. Yeah, there's a, there's a saying that uh, never be an ivory tower marketer or never be an ivory tower CEO. And the, and the phrase is don't just sit in the headquarters and think you know everything. So what I've been trying to do is uh, get out to our restaurants. And so I didn't do it this time because it's a short trip, but every trip I go on to, I try to go into restaurants and I try to meet the team and I try to understand the line and how to make food and get on the headset and talk about um, and listen to the drive through And I'm curious to learn more uh, about, about restaurant operations and how it works and the team members. And if you talk to our team members, um, depending on where you are, they've worked at Taco Bell 20 years. Some of it, it's their only job. And just to hear their stories and hear why they love the brand and, and hear why they work at Taco Bell is, is, is incredible. So one thing I want to learn, because I don't come from the industry, is truly the inner workings of how the store works. Uh, and I'm excited to, to do it. So when you want to talk a little bit, you, you said earlier, I think you had 5,000 restaurants domestically, 1,000 overseas. What are some of the things that Taco Bell's thinking about when it looks overseas? Yeah. Uh, I told, the, I told the class that um, if you're human, you've ate uh, fried chicken, pizza, or a hamburger. Who hasn't ate one of those things? Everybody. But when you go to uh, India, China, Malaysia, uh, Japan, tacos are like from outer space. People don't know how to eat them. They don't know how many to order. Do you eat them this way? Do you eat them this way? And so for us, while we're an incredible... Uh, successful brand in the U.S. We've got a cult following. We've got stores. We've got great momentum. It's almost the exact opposite internationally. You go to India, and you know maybe our flavor profile's off. You go to China, they don't they don't know how to eat a taco. So for us to be successful internationally, we have to educate people around tacos and burritos and nachos, what they are, why they're so amazing, how to how to eat them, and you got to educate people on Taco Bell. There's a, there's a brand magic of Taco Bell that we're trying to import internationally to, to certain countries like Spain or India. And uh, if we can educate people on the magic of tacos and we can and educate people on the magic of the Taco Bell brand, we'll be successful. We just haven't figured out quite how to do that yet. Oh, no, don't let it, don't let it be from the back. <laughs> not again, not again. <laughs> there you go, there you go. Sir, is there a marketing campaign for Jordan brand that you worked on that you're most proud of? Mm, that's a good one. I think in Jordan, when I got to Jordan, I think it was the 24 game shoe, which was like my first game shoe. And as you guys know, the game shoe is the biggest launch for, for the brand. And so what I remember is just, I can't remember the exact campaign, but just I remember working on arguably or maybe not arguably, the best basketball player of all time's shoe was just something that, you know, it's a, you know, pinch me moment. Like, are you, are you really doing this right now? And I probably worked on 24, 5, 6, and 7. Uh, and they were all fantastic. But working on that first one to be able to say I worked on the launch of a Michael Jordan shoe was probably um, one of those career moments where you just can't believe you're in that moment. All right, thanks so much, Sean, for being here. Let's give him a big round of applause. Really appreciate you coming back to campus, and I want to thank our panelists for their great questions. Again, thank you so much.